So the, today the feast is Santa versus Pope and Martyr. And the Father's only goes to him to be here in Boise, in Idaho here. In a few considerations, yesterday the feast of Jesus Christ, the King. And that to remember that Christ is the King. And, and one of the changes they made at Vatican II, which was one of the subtle bad changes of Vatican II, was the moving of the Feast of Christ the King to the end of the liturgical year on the 24th Sunday after Pentecost. On the 24th Sunday after Pentecost, this is the last day of the year, and on this day Jesus Christ comes to judge living and the dead. And he will judge all men of all times, and he will make a physical reign over this entire world, so that every human being that has ever lived or ever been conceived the babies and infants in the womb, as well as all those that have been born, every human being shall be gathered together in the valley of Josephat and judged by Jesus Christ. And so they said to the modern church, well, it's better for us to move the Feast of Christ the King, which Pius the, uh, the 11th put on the last Sunday of October, we should move it to the end of the year, so that on the day of the judgment we recognize that Jesus Christ is going to be the King. And this, in fact, is a very bad thing. Because Jesus Christ is not only king in, in ruling this world physically at the very end of the world, but he must also rule physically now. There must be a physical dominion of Jesus Christ. He does not only reign spiritually, he does not only reign over souls. So one of the reasons why it is not good to put the Feast of Christ the King at the very, very, very end of the liturgical year is because it could give one the impression that Jesus Christ will only come in his humanity to rule over men and their bodies on the day of judgment. Because remember, on the day of judgment, the body is going to join in the judgment of the soul. Now, Jesus Christ is going to judge bodies and souls. He judges the soul on the day of the particular judgment, but he will judge the body with the soul on the day of the general judgment. On that day, Jesus Christ the King shall judge. And what does he say he's going to judge with? He says, I will judge all men, and you apostles shall judge with me. So there will be 12 judges of the New Testament, which will be the principal judges. These are the 12 apostles. There will also be 12 judges taken from the Old Testament. So 12 of Abraham and, uh, and uh, some of the great prophets of the Old Testament, 12 will be chosen. And 12 of the Old Testament on one side of our Lord, 12 of the New Testament, and they shall participate in the judgment. So the Jesus Christ judges, but there shall be 24 judges beside him. So there will be a great judgment, a very solemn judgment. And they shall be in their flesh judging. St. Peter, Peter, Andrew, James, John, Thomas, James, Philip, Matthew, Simon, Jude, and St. Matthias who takes the place of Judas, who should have been one of those judges, he is going to judge all men of all time. Not only of the New Testament, but also of the Old. So that Peter does hold the keys. You often that He really does hold the keys to the kingdom of heaven, and the other apostles also shall have a power of keys as well. And they are going to be judges. Now, when we say that Jesus Christ is king, he is not just the king of hearts. He's not just a king of spirit and king of supernatural things, but he must have a physical kingship. This is one reason why with the Pope, the Pope is one who rules not only the Holy Mother of the Church, but he rules the papal states. He rules an army. He rules a physical land. He levies taxes. He does all the things that a king does and a ruler of a country does. He has the power of physical king. And you remember, this is very important because you'll notice in the Old Testament, all of the rulers who represented God, how did they demonstrate their rule over the Jewish people? They ruled the armies. They ruled the taxes. They ruled everything over the Jewish people. Remember when God, the Jewish people complained to God and said, we're tired of being ruled by prophets. We're tired of just having a prophet. All the other kingdoms have armies. All the other kingdoms have courts. All the other kingdoms have, have kings and nobles and a place where they can say their king is. But our king is Samuel. Our king is a judge. He walks around and prays. He walks around and does miracles. But he doesn't have a court. And when if we have to fight an army, Samuel just says, gather together and fight. 
like Joshua did. Joshua was the head of the whole religion. He was, what did he do? He led the Jews in battle. He was not only a spiritual ruler of God, he was a material ruler of God. Now one of the lies that is put forth in the Protestants in the New Testament is, in recent years, that the priest of God, the holy bishop, the pope, these are rulers of the spiritual realm. They're not rulers of the material realm. They're not rulers of the physical realm. They have no right to say what to do in physical things. And yet if you read back in history, who preached the crusades? Priests and bishops and the pope. St. Pius V said, the Muslims are causing trouble and they are threatening Christendom. Therefore, I command the kings of Europe to gather together, the armies to gather together, to go out and reel an army with swords and with cannons and with ships, and to go and fight against Islam. You will go and fight against them physically. You'll go and wage war against them physically, because they are causing trouble in the kingdom of, the, of, of God on earth. We are in the church militant, the church fighting. The fighting church is not only fighting spiritually, by its rosaries and by its masses and by its prayers. But the church militant must also fight in the physical realm. There will be crusades. There will be gatherings of the armies to defend the rights of God. And there is also a physical dominion. So that, for instance, the church, every single church building, is outside of the dominion of the king. So that in every country, there are church buildings. And this is a reminder of the time of the Jews, when God commanded that there are 12 tribes and each 12 shall have their physical property that they own. Each, each tribe has a right of private property. Each right has a tri the right of dominion over its own land. And therefore, all 12 tribes are going to be divided up into 11 parcels. parcels. And so there will be 11 different kingdoms within Israel. But the 12th kingdom is the kingdom of the Levites. And the twelfth kingdom is a kingdom of the priests of God. Now the priest of God rules in all places. He doesn't just rule in one place. Therefore the Levites shall not be given their own land. They shall have land amongst all the eleven tribes. And in regard to the, and so that they will have land in every place. They will take care of the worship of the Jews in each of the eleven precincts. And they will have synagogues, and they will have buildings of worship. They will have places of prayer, and they will have their own land. And this land shall be the place where the Jews shall gather together, even though they can't all go to the temple. They're going to get in Jerusalem. They will gather together, and they will pray under the direction of the priests in the Levites' own land. And the Levites have power of property, and they have rights. When we come to the New Testament, the Levites are the priests of the church. When I was ordained a priest, it is said, receive the second order of Levi. We are Levites. And that when you when, that, that the, the, the and also when consecrated a bishop, may the power of Aaron enter into this man. Aaron was a priest of the Old Testament. He did not have the priesthood of the New Testament, but Aaron had dominion over the people. They asked him, Who is in charge here when Moses goes up the mountain? Aaron was in charge. And Aaron decided what must be done. And unfortunately, Aaron decided to do wicked things. Aaron decided to build a golden calf. Aaron decided to, to allow himself to, be, to succumb to the people. Now, in the church, the priest and the bishop have physical power. They have power over land, over property, over things. That is why, for instance, in the Catholic kingdoms, whenever a man was a murderer, or he was fleeing from the police, or he was wanted for any crime, he could run into any church, and that meant the church grounds. So, for instance, supposing that the, this is the Saint, uh, Saint, uh, uh, Church of, of, of St. Anthony, and the church grounds begin at the, at, the, at the border of the street, when a man being chased by the police, he could run into the grounds, he would so he would cry, sanctuary, sanctuary. Once he entered into the grounds, he was now outside the jurisdiction of the police. And he could go inside the church, and he could be in the church grounds, and it was like an embassy, in which you, when you, and, and the idea behind the embassy is, you have a Canadian embassy in the United States, you've got a Russian embassy in the United States, and that land of the embassy is considered part of the land of Russia. 
It is outside of the dominion of the United States. It is part of the land of India, outside the dominion of the United States. And hence, we don't enter that land without the permission of the leaders of that land. So that there is a there is a an independence of each church. Each church is a true church. No false church has any of these rights. They have no rights whatsoever. But the true church of Jesus Christ has physical rights. When someone enters into the land of the church, he can cry sanctuary. And the police cannot capture him. They cannot arrest him. They can't do anything until he goes out from the sanctuary. And then they can arrest him. Or they must ask the priest or the bishop. Will you please release to us, extradite to us that man who is a criminal? And the priest says, no, I will not do it. Then he shall not be extradited and he cannot be arrested. They can post guards around the church and wait for that man to leave. And when they leave, then he can be arrested. The rights of the church are sacred and sovereign, and they are also physical. Jesus Christ made the Pope to be not only a ruler of hearts, but he has a physical dominion, and he has rights over material things. And every single church on earth, every Catholic church on earth, and no other church has these rights, only the Catholic church, uh, has the, the right of an independence from the kingdom. So if there is a Protestant church and there is a Muslim a Muslim mosque and there is an, a, a Jewish synagogue and some other kind of church, the government can go into that church and out of it as it pleases because they have no rights. They are of the devil. They have no rights. They have only the right of private property. Just like you have the right of private property. But even though you have the right of private property, if there is a murderer in your house, if a crime is committed in your house, the soldiers can come in, the police can come in, because you are a part of the kingdom of America. However, the Catholic Church is above America. And the Catholic Church is above every single state and every single country. And therefore, the Catholic Church building has an independence. It must be independent from the king. And it has no uh, right to be under the king. This is the foundation, for instance, of the tax exemption of the church. The church is tax exempt. The church can levy taxes. In the old day, the church can say, you must pay taxes. A form of doing this is giving a stipend for a mass or, or giving, a, giving your Sunday collection, paying a tenth part of your possessions. A tenth part of your money goes to the church so that it might be sustained and that the alert laborer is worthy of his hire. So the church has the right to levy taxes, to, but it does not pay taxes because the church is above the state and therefore it is independent. And that this the... the and there are martyrs that have died over this independence. St. Gregory the Seventh defended the independence of the church, and he said the church cannot be governed by the state. So one of the very great evils of this coronavirus evil that's going on is the fact that the government is coming into the church and saying, you cannot have masks, you must be socially distant, you have to wear a mask, we will decide what you can and cannot do inside of the church. Now inside of churches run by the devil, that's not a problem. They should close those churches anyway. But inside of the church of God, which is the church of God himself, the true God that made this country, the true God that made the entire world, there cannot be and there should not be any dominion of the state over the church. But the church rather has dominion the other way. And it is also a custom in Catholic countries. The bishop should always live near the king so that you have a square in any major city in a Catholic country. On one side of the square is the cathedral, and the bishop there resides. On the other side of the square is the king. And the, why is it this way? So that if the king is a bad boy, the bishop can walk out of the cathedral, walk across the square, and say, you're not following the law of God. You don't want to go on a long trip. He walks across the square and says, you're not following the law of God. You have rights over your kingdom, and I don't interfere with your kingdom beyond necessity. But when you go against the law of God, you are going against the, 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 the nature, the way God made things, and we have dominion in every, in every single kingdom. Just like the Levites had homes in every one of the 11 provinces of Israel. So the Catholic Church should have churches in every one of the states and countries throughout the entire world. And in the states and countries, they have rights and independence. They should not be interfered with. They do not have to pay taxes. They are, they are there to monitor that the law of God is fulfilled in every one of these places. And they have an independence from the state that's supposed to be there. And they have the right to govern physically their own land. And those who are on the outside have no right to have dominion over the church. This, is the, this was a cause of controversy amongst kings for since the time of Christ that they didn't like the idea of having to 
of not controlling the bishop and not controlling the priest and not controlling the church rose up the heresy of lay investiture, the heresy by which the, 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 the king thought and the duke thought that he had authority over the church. We, we will decide the material things. You can talk about spiritual things. Now, one reason why the church has a material authority is that God is not the ruler and creator of spiritual things. God is the ruler and creator of everything, of all things and each and everything. He rules over the body as well as the soul. He rules over the state and the city as well as the church. And therefore, he should have representatives of his kingdom in every single country who are under the dominion of the Holy Father and on this earth and who are supposed to watch over the rights of God being observed in those countries. Now, when the church goes against her duty and does not defend the rights of God, then what happens is that the people of the state say, if you're not defending the rights of God, then over time they will say, the heck with your independence. We don't care about your independence. You're not following the rights of God, the law of God anyway. And they will overtake the church. And this has happened down the last 500 years, and especially in the last uh, period of the last 100 years. And now we see the complete failure of the church in that the church now has no rights of any kind, not even leftover rights. Now the police can come in and say, where you sit in your pews? They can say, where you sit in your pews? You've got to have a rope between pew B and pew C, and, the, and, and the, another rope between D and E, another rope between F and, uh, and, and H, and so on. And then they can decide uh, how far you can sit from one another. They can decide what to, whether you're going to have Mass. They even decide whether you're going to sing at Mass. They would also try to make rules in Canada whether you can give out Holy Communion or not. And all these things are not only sins, which should never be tolerated by the priests of God, but they are abominations that speak against the first commandment. When the, when the king thinks he can come in, and the president thinks he can come in and rule within the church of God, what's going to happen within the true church of God? Not about the false churches, but within the true church of God. This is a sin against the first commandment. It's a sin against God. And the duty of the priest and bishop is to stand up for the rights of the church and the rights of God. This is why, for instance, one positive thing that's happening right now is that there are some priests, Novus Ordo priests, and some other priests who are saying, I am sorry that I gave in at the first pandemic, the first uh, complaint of the pandemic, but I'm not going to do that again. I'm not going to shut down the church. I'm not going to refuse Holy Communion. I'm not going to stop giving the sacraments to God because of the laws of men. I follow the law of God. A priest in Wales, no sort of priest in Wales said that. I will follow the law of God, not the law of men. And so that even though he's in error, he recognizes about the new mass. He shouldn't be saying the new mass. But he recognizes there's, it's wrong to not to, to, for the state to come in and tell me what to do in, in, the, in this church of God. So the, the Pope must rule not only spiritually but also physically. And that we have a great evil going on in the church today, so many evils. That one of them is that we're no longer following, that we're no longer recognizing that the church has a physical dominion, and not only a spiritual dominion. It is the only way in which I can practice my priesthood is if my body is still connected to my soul. I'll be a priest forever, always a priest for all eternity. But I can only practice my priesthood when my body is connected to my soul before death. Once I die, I will still be a priest. The body will rise again from the dead, reunited to the soul. But I can only act as a representative of God in this earth when my body is connected to my soul and only through my body. Hence, it is most necessary that the priests of God not only be quote-unquote spiritual and talk about what goes on in your hearts, what goes on in your souls, and what goes on in your prayers, all those type of things. He must have said, no, you will live physically the right kind of life. That means that you will stay in one marriage. That means you will put crucifixes in your house. It means you will have representations of God inside of your workplace. It means you will pay tithes. You should pay tithes to the church. And you will also uh, do, do your duty towards the state. You will make sure that you pay your tithes to the church, pay your taxes, not $100 billion in taxes, but some taxes. And you will pay your taxes, and you will take care of your duty towards the state. <laughs> You will, you will, it is the duty of the priest to point out the duties towards God, the duties towards the neighbor, and, and that these duties are not only the quote-unquote spiritual duties, but also material and physical duties. And that it is also to monitor the king and monitor the rulers. And these rulers go against the law of God, the priests of God, the bishop of God, the Holy Father. is supposed to stand up and say, thou shalt not do this. He's supposed to defend the flock of Christ. He's supposed to defend the rights of God. 
that he is supposed to spread his kingdom not only spiritually but physically throughout the world. And this aspect of the priesthood has been forgotten and is almost gone now. The Pope reigns now in 200 acres or 300 acres in the city of Rome, and he has no authority outside of those 300 acres. And even there, he doesn't do much. And our present Holy Father continues to add you sin upon sin, that is trying to justify homosexual unions and then and then uh, and then uh, uh, pagan uh, coins and and then uh, so the president bringing out the greater abominations against the first commandment and against the other commandments as well but in any case we pray for his conversion and that when we have a conversion of the holy father it can't be just a spiritual conversion it must be a material and physical conversion not only reaching to the souls and to the ideas but to every aspect of our lives and our world. In closing, I bless you all. In the name of the Father, and the Son, and the Holy Ghost. Amen.